Welcome to this international conference on the craft of the miller. My name is Nicole Bakker and I will be moderating this conference. And I'm honored to give the floor to our Minister of Education, Culture and Science, Mrs. Ingrid van Engelshoven, for the official welcome. Dear participants, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you participating today. It's wonderful that so many of you are able to join us from all over the world. Of course, the circumstances are a little different than intended. I was supposed to welcome you at the Zaanse Schans, um, among our beautiful mills and millers. Instead, you are probably in your mill, at home or at the office, looking at me on your computer screen. Still, I am thrilled that we are all here today to talk about intangible heritage and the craft of the miller. For me, intangible heritage around the world is vital. It paves the way for mutual understanding and dialogue. It contributes to a sense of identity and shared communities. I believe this is especially relevant in these times of profound anxiety and uncertainty. For the Netherlands, the craft of the miller has played a significant role in Dutch society. Mills and millers have always been a part of the Dutch landscape as made famous by the Dutch master painters. They have always been a sustainable means of production for our country and turned our landscape into an energy landscape. And while the economic function of the mills largely disappeared, their social and cultural functions remain. There are, for example, multiple training courses for aspiring millers. Many people come and visit our regional and national mill days. Children learn about mills in school by reading about them and visiting them. And during this pandemic, we see that more and more people buy flour and other products at their local mills. If you ask me, the craft of the miller is very much alive. This is why it was such an honor when, in 2017, the Dutch craft of the miller was inscribed in the UNESCO representative list for safeguarding intangible cultural heritage. For us, Safeguarding also means exchanging knowledge, experience and skills with other millers and mill experts all around the world. This is what today is about. Today is an important step in us working together, not just to safeguard the craft of the miller today, but to make it flourish in the centuries to come. For now, I wish all of you an inspiring conference and I look forward to seeing the results. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Van Engelshoven, for your kind words. And we feel very supported by you, by introducing and your efforts by introducing this conference. And we are grateful for everything your ministry does for the safeguarding of the craft of the miller. I'm happy to say that almost more than 200 people have registered for this conference and almost 30 countries have joined us. And that's a great start for the network we want to build together. And we are the organizing parties of this conference. The Dutch Guild of Volunteer Millers, the Fries Guild of Millers, the Corn Millers Guild, the Dutch Mill Organization. And we are supported by the Dutch Center of Intangible Cultural Heritage, the Cultural Heritage Agency, and of course, the Ministry of Education, Culture and Science. And we are very happy to organize this conference. In 2017, the craft of the miller was the Kingdom of the Netherlands' first inscription on the representative list of the UNESCO Convention for the Safeguarding of the Intangible Cultural Heritage. However, this craft is not unique to the Netherlands. By organizing an international conference, we aim to bring together wind and water mill parties from all over the world to share knowledge, skills, and develop an international network of millers and mill societies. The wish for an international network is broadly supported within the Netherlands, but also abroad and worldwide. We hope that a network of miller and mill organizations will help to safeguard the craft of the miller and the mills in the future. As Minister van Eelshoff already said, we initially intended to have convene a conference in the Netherlands this summer. But due to the COVID-19 safety regulations, 
it was cancelled. But we didn't want to wait for us to meet in person, and that's why we organized this online version. Before we start, some ground rules for this conference. Well, you're participating in a webinar and your video will be not shown and your microphone is off. You will inv are invited to send your questions in on the Q&A and participate in the polls during the program. The Q&A will be facilitated by Eric Kopp, the chairman of the Dutch Guild of Volunteer Millers and we will undoubtedly hear him later on. For all technical questions, please you just use the chat function, not the Q&A to reach our technical moderator. This session will be recorded and is available afterwards. And during the online conference, there will be a break of 10 minutes in which we will show the, mail, the craft of the Miller film. Let me take you to the program and then we start. First, we have Alain Gauwblomme. Um, and he will tell us about the craft of the Miller in Belgium. The second speaker is Jonathan Cook, who will go into the craft of the miller in the United Kingdom in the 21st century. And as promised, then will be a short break with the film, The Craft of the Miller, Operating Windmills and Water Mills, which was made in, for the application at UNESCO in 2017. Uh, this week, we heard the sad news that the maker of the film, Jos Kuyer, suddenly passed away and we are sympathizing with his family and we wish them all the well and strength in this difficult period. After this short break, Antoine Gauthier and Marjana Amin will give a presentation on the craft of the miller in Canada. And Philip Tomczewski, the fourth speaker, will tell you something about the windmills in Poland and the world of traditional milling. If you have questions during the presentations, please do not hesitate to use the Q&A and I will present your question at the appropriate time at the speakers, if they are interesting, of course. The last part of the conference will be a panel session with the speakers and with input from you, the participants of this conference. The subject of this panel session is the future, connecting and networking. Well, now it's time for our first speaker, Alain Gauwblom, and I hope he will Turn on his video and speaker at the moment. Just wait a second. I can hear him clicking now. <laughs> and there is Alain from Belgium. Welcome, Alain. Yes, I'm here, but uh, the video doesn't start. Uh, you're now in, we see, we see you and we can hear you, so that's great. Okay, so you, okay, okay. Here is your PowerPoint. I give okay. the floor to you. Okay. Welcome to Belgium and the, to the Interactive Mill Museum MOLA. I'm the chairman of the Mill Forum of Flanders and Miller in a flower mill and in a horse mill. By the way, the name of the horse is Ruby. As you can see in the first slide, we have, we still have about 100 operational water mills in Flanders and Brussels, and about 150 operational wind power mills, post mills and cap winders, including one flex mill. And the flex mill is a mill in which the hard shell or the flex stem is uh, removed in order to produce linen. In the French-speaking part of Belgium, there are only a few operational water and windmills. Thanks to local initiatives and local committees, there is no umbrella organization. Um, Walloon millers um, are trained in Flanders and are mostly members of Flemish miller groups. In Flanders, we have two umbrella mill associations, Molen voor in Vlaanderen and Leven de Molens. Um, they assist local mill associations, millers and mill owners in word and deed. They help them to compile a file on subsidies and restoration activities. They train new millers, organize mill days and have contacts with the competent authorities. 
They have about 1,000 trained voluntary millers and only four professional millers who live from the water and the wind. Um, less than, for example, in Holland, that they have more volunteer millers who activate the millstones and who grind grain and sell flour and oil to passers-by and uh, home bakers, for example. The craft of the miller was recognized in Flanders about uh, two months ago, two or three months ago. Voluntary millers hand their skills and traditions down to the next generation since 1970. An increasing number of mostly voluntary millers promotes the consumption of their products within the context of a short circuit buy, sell and trade system. And the National Food and Drug Organization authorizes the trade in foodstuffs produced by millers. Thank you, Alem. This was your last slide. No, 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 no. no. Okay, you go on. Thank you. Go you on. Lost, no, sorry. Um, next slide, please. We, pre we preserve our mills by, by carrying out maintenance work, mostly as a team, by training new millers and by organizing mill days, and of course, by selling flour and oil. We promote our whole wheat flour as the best flower in the whole world. The government subsidizes restoration and maintenance work for about 60%, can be lower, can be higher. Um, you may know that Belgium is a very complex state with a number of language uh, communities. This leads to a, a very confusing separation between authorities in, ch in charge of intangible and those responsible for tangible heritage. In addition, all these rules change too often and we have no consistent long-term policy. And this lack of long-term policy has a, a negative impact, of course, on the condition, the state of maintenance of heritage in general. Many millers and mill owners um, have, for example, no idea what rules apply and who is in charge. We see, we are seeing an increase in the number of participants in the middle schools, about 100 every two years. We teach them the traditional topics like history, craft of the mill, safety, mill functions. Of course, trainees um, have to be able to operate a mill properly and safely. Um, but we put, we put more focus on enthusiasm. Um, our training is concentrated less on pure technical know-how and more on the miller, on the mill perspective. Um, we, we have more faith in our gut feeling when we, um, when we test uh, a journeyman, a trainee. Uh, for example, we we also count the number of tears the trainee wipes away when leaving a mill. The training includes 10 theoretical sessions and about 100 hours of practical training. We organize for them special training, day, training days and uh, of course a theoretical exam at the end with multiple choice questions. The practical exam, uh, important to note, is that it includes also the also a grain grinding or old pressing tests. That means that there has to be enough wind on the day of the exam to activate the millstones. I summarized the number of issues, objectives. Um, we need in Flanders uh, more experienced instructors. Uh, many older mills have passed, have passed away in recent years. Dutch millers wonder why we call our passers, our successful candidates, already masters at the end of a two-year training course. The idea to give them this distinction, this qualification, 
was launched in the 1970s in order to make the, the Graft of the Miller attractive again. The master title refers to the heyday of Miller's, medieval Miller's working with journeyman. Finally, Flemings should, should better promote their own mill heritage. And I will start today. Please keep in mind, dear mill friends, that it's very likely that the first vertical mill, windmill was built in the 12th century in the county of Flanders. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anne Kaublom. What a great story. And uh, I see you uh, have uh, won the contest of the oldest mill probably from the Netherlands, but that's another story for another time. Thank you very much. Um, I want to ask Eric Kopp, uh, the chairman of the Guild of Volunteer Mirrors, are there any questions in the Q&A? Yes, there is uh, just one question from the field and that is concerning the financial position of the mills in Belgium. Alain, um, how is the financial position of the mills in Belgium and is there any support of the government? Well, we, the, the government gives us about 60% uh, subsidies for mill restorations. Um, but a lot of mills, about 500, uh, are non-operational. The financial situation in Belgium is not very good. Yeah. Yes. All right, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, maybe I have uh, a question for, uh, for the Belgium uh, millers and uh, uh, for the Belgium government. Um, the way the Belgians approach their mills and millers is similar to, uh, to the Dutch approach. Is there any chance the Belgian government is willing to join the Netherlands in the recognition of the craft of the miller for UNESCO? So um, is there any chance you, you can join the Netherlands in, uh, in, in their in UNESCO recognition? Yes, of course. So what has to be done? It has to be done. Um, I don't know, it has to be done. Um, uh, can, can we help you? We have already the recognition in Flanders um, about, about, um, about three or four months ago, the two mill, the two umbrella organizations submitted the dossier to the to the Flemish authorities, and the craft of the miller was recognized a few months ago. All right. Okay. So that's uh, that's a start then. Well, that's great. Okay. And uh, thank you, Ale. Um, I will. See, uh, it's almost time indeed to go to the next uh, speaker. Uh, so thank you, Alain. Um, I want to ask you to, un to mute yourself and put off your video. And I welcome Jonathan Cook, miller in the United Kingdom and sitting in his mill. Hi, Jonathan. Good afternoon, Nicole. Good afternoon, everyone. And indeed, a uh, warm welcome uh, to uh, Foster's Mill uh, here in Swaffham Prior uh, in the east of the UK. So I'm Jonathan Cook. And I'm here to give you an overview of the craft of the miller in the UK today. Before I begin, I'd like to briefly introduce myself. As I mentioned, I'm the owner and miller of Foster's Mill in a place called Swaffham Prior in Eastern England, close to Cambridge. I've been a miller for around 22 years. And during that time, I've been in closely involved with two, the two organizations that represent and support traditional mills in the UK the mill section of the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings and the traditional Corn Millers Guild. I was chairman of the mill section for five years and held the posts of chairman and secretary of the traditional Corn Millers Guild in total covering a period of around 13 years. The Priors Flour, which is my milling business, sells organic flour to bakeries, restaurants, shops and customers all over the UK. We're in our 21st year and sell a range of 13 different types of flour milled from wheat, rye and spelt grains. If I may, I'd now like to introduce my mill. Uh, so Foster's Mill was built in 1857, uh, replacing a post mill which stood on this site. Uh, the first three photos I here show here show the mill between 1920 and 1930. As you can see, 
Uh, it's a brick tower mill with two pairs of French burr millstones. Uh, the mill worked until 1946 when the miller retired and was returned to working order in 1992. We have three pairs of stones now grinding flour with wind power and electric power in order to meet demand. Let me now give you an overview of traditional milling in the UK today. So I offer some statistics. There are around 450 complete water mills. Of those, around 30 mills are working weekly or more frequently in regular use. And there are around 120 workable water mills uh, used for demonstration purposes. In terms of our windmills, uh, there are around 120 complete windmills. Around 12 of these are working weekly or more frequently, primarily milling flour. An additional 14 are in a workable state and are used for demonstration purposes by their teams. We don't have any specific uh, data for the number of millers, but we estimate that between 30 and 50 millers are paid working part-time uh, or full-time in the mills uh, around the UK. And we estimate that between 200 and 300 people are involved in volunteering, supporting our mills. Our milling heritage uh, is facing a tough time, even before the COVID pandemic. And whilst there are some great things going on, there are some significant challenges. As I'll explain shortly, funds for heritage from the UK government have always been very limited. Local councils, who historically played an active role in financially supporting some of our mills, have over the last 10 years tried to hand over mills to the care of local voluntary groups. Five years ago, Alford Mill, which is on the left of the three pictures I'm showing, was a working mill, shop and tea room. Sadly today, as you can see, it stands idle with no sales and fantail. The council that owns it is not able to fund its maintenance and repair. There are also many mills such as Cross in Hand Post Mill, which is on the right in Sussex, uh, a mill which is in need of urgent financial support to conserve the mill and its structure and secure its future. And there are many mills such as Cross in Hands. It's interesting to note that this mill was in a workable state in 1960. I have to say there are also some great exceptions, mills that are in great repair and working and uh, enjoying great support, such as the majestic Maud Foster Mill, which you can see in the middle uh, in Boston, owned uh, privately by the Waterfield family. Uh, James and his team keep this mill, as you can see, in fantastic condition. It's our busiest commercial flower producing windmill in the UK, and what a lovely site it is too. I'd now like to introduce the two organizations which protect and promote traditional mills in the UK. The mill section of the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings was founded in 1931 to protect wind and water mills, which were at that time being demolished at an alarming rate. It's the largest, oldest, and most technically expert national pressure group in the fighting to save buildings from decay, demolition, and change. The work of the mill section is guided by its philosophy of repair, which sets out how we believe mills should be conserved and repaired, retaining as much of the original material as possible. It's actually a philosophy studied by the Dutch Cultural Heritage Agency in the development uh, of your recent pioneering future for mills policy. The mill section has a membership of around 850 people. It organizes events, including our National Mills Weekend, in May each year when over 300 mills open to the public. It provides technical advice, it comments on planning applications, offering training and small financial grants. Our traditional corn millers guild represents around uh, traditional mills producing flour for customers. We were founded in about 1987 and now have 35 member mills across the UK. Our members supply a wide range of customers uh, and most of them producing less than 500 tonnes of flour per year, the majority producing between five and 50 tonnes. Member mills must meet a set of criteria for membership, including product knowledge, quality, hygiene, 
and maintenance skills. As mentioned earlier, the UK government provides very limited support for our milling heritage. Over the 10 year period, 2010 to 2020, just over one million pounds was paid to cover repairs and project management costs, supporting 24 traditional mill projects in the UK. It's a pretty small amount of money. Our UK National Lottery has uh, in recent years provided much larger sums of money for the repair and conservation of many mills. And this has been a great uh, important benefit to our heritage, our milling heritage. Currently, there are no formal training programs or qualifications for millers, whether volunteer or professional. And we recognize this is a key challenge. To date, our millers are professional by experience and we have some highly skilled and highly experienced millers, but these skills are not formally assessed. And so in reality, there is quite significant variation in the ways that some of our mills are managed, run and maintained. The SPAB runs some basic introductory courses. We're actively working on developing a training program and benefiting from knowledge sharing from our milling colleagues in the Netherlands. The Volunteer Corn Millers Guild has been really helpful in sharing information, knowledge, and we look forward to building these partnerships further. We want to create a real future for millers in the UK, for traditional milling to be recognised as a craft profession, to offer something exciting for future generations, and in doing so, safeguard what we believe is a fabulous milling heritage. The UK market today for traditionally stone ground flour is growing rapidly. There's a fantastic story around traditional flour and in our mills. And I hope that we can do this working with our international friends. So thank you for the opportunity of sharing something of our lives as traditional millers here in 21st century United Kingdom. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for this interesting story, for this overview of all the facts and figures. Um, Eric, do we have a question for Jonathan from the Q&A? Yes, from the field, we have um, one question from Wim Janssen, uh, probably from the Netherlands, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is um, about the cooperation between mills in Great Britain. Yep. Uh, how is the cooperation between the mills in Great Britain? And what at the moment is the status of the heritage of mills? And um, are there any plans for the future conditioning heritage of the mills? Okay, so three parts to that, that question, if I'm understanding that. Um, so first of all, in terms of cooperation, um, there's an increasing amount of cooperation. Um, the internet has been great. Uh, we have an online forum, uh, windmill hoppers and watermill hoppers that I know some people may be uh, uh, linked up to, which uh, regularly shares all sorts of information, fun facts and photographs. But in that, there's a lot of practical guidance and support, which is great. Uh, our mill section uh, uh, of the SPAB uh, produces a quarterly newsletter and provides information sharing. There are some local mills groups who also support each other. So there are a variety of networks. And uh, this is great in terms of providing advice, guidance and help to us practical millers, but also to the volunteers who are supporting uh, mills who are in a variety of different states from uh, conserving um, the basic uh, you know, milling, uh, the fabric of the mill through to mills that are in ability to work. So um, yes, it, it's growing, um, but we can always do more. So that was the first part. Eric, could you remind me of the second part of the question, please? Well, the, the, the most important uh, part of the question is, what are the plans for the future conditioning heritage of the mills? Right, uh, so this is a challenge for us. Uh, I've mentioned in my presentation that uh, the funding that is available uh, from the state is very limited and has reduced. Um, equally, as in I'm sure many of the countries represented here today, we struggle to engage some of our young people uh, and people to come together in some uh, in some areas. And so this provides a challenge for people uh, wanting to volunteer and help, but equally the, the funds. So um, we're working on this, uh, but it's an important and critical area in order that we can conserve what we have and indeed make sure that we both return our mills to working order and then critically that we're able to maintain them, both in terms of working with them and making sure that all that money that's invested in repair is actually 
um, you know, has a long-term future because the maintenance is done and the mills are used for the purpose which they were intended. So that's a, a, it's a key area for us. I'll make no bones about it. There's some great stuff going on, but we want to do more. I think we have time for one more question, Eric, for Jonathan. Yes, well, there are many questions are now uh, coming in, but I try to combine something. Um, um, how are citizens being motivated to support financing, financing uh, mills maintenance? And is there any connection with tourism? So uh, in terms of the first part, in terms of, you know, getting people uh, involved, um, there are you know, lo local groups that support uh, local mills. And so fundraising activities are, you know, are used to um, get people interested and to provide funds and support. Um, so that you know, is, is a key way in which uh, we're getting uh, funding in to help mills. Um, we also have the, the National Lottery, which I've mentioned, which uh, is providing support where possible. Uh, Organisations like the Mill Section are providing grants uh, in order to also help. So there are there are multiple different ways, and uh, you know, there are some big local groups. So this is not all a difficult picture, but I think it's uh, fair to say that so many uh, environments, uh, you know, local groups and societies are struggling and indeed of course in a situation like we're in at the moment where people can't actually get together then those activities have to go online. So that was the first part, I'm sorry, I just reminded and, uh, The second part is uh, how you uh, uh, combine uh, opening times or opening of mills and tourism. So um, we, uh, there are in some, some areas um, sort of routes and indeed uh, the Via Molina is something that we are very excited and interested in building uh, and becoming part of. Uh, so publicly uh, advertising routes that people can travel around. Uh, in my own area here, we also have a route that people can, can follow and there's publicity for that. Um, so there are sort of various networks. Our National Mills Weekend uh, publishes a huge amount of information, very similar to the Netherlands and indeed other countries to raise awareness of when mills are open. Equally our tourist information services and of course, a great online uh, you know, range of different websites that also promote our mills. But yeah, it's all about, from us, it's about networking, it's about integrating uh, mills to make people aware of the great uh, environment they are and the wonderful places. I will just say that uh, uh, windmills were voted very recently the most loved building in the UK. So I'll just uh, note that one. Congratulations, Jonathan. Yeah. Congratulations. Well, thank you for your uh, presentation and answers to the questions. Um, I believe you're going now to the office uh, before you participate in the panel session. Am, am I right? It's a little bit cool to be in the mill for the rest of the afternoon, as many of you millers on the call will, I'm sure, know. So yes, I'm going to sneak back into the office and I'll see you all well, later. We'll see you in a bit. Thank you very much for your uh, input. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, then we now go on to the film, The Craft of the Miller, uh, the story of the Dutch miller, Martin Dorman. And uh, we will take about 10 minutes for this uh, film. Ik werk vijf à zes dagen in de week. Door de week natuurlijk s'morgens vroeg beginnen op de molen. De molen op de wind zetten, gaan malen, bestellingen binnenhalen. In hart en nieren ben ik een korenmolenaar. En dat houdt in dus dat je met de windmolen op windkracht. En daarmee worden de molenstenen aangedreven die in deze houten kuip zitten. En daarmee malen we dus graan tot meel. De specifieke kwaliteiten zijn dat je graankennis hebt, kennis van de stenen hebt, kennis van broodbakken hebt. Maar heel belangrijk is het product. Het product is de kern van het hele korenmolenaarschap. Mijn vader die was molenaar in Wilnis op de korenmolen, de korenmolen, de veenmolen. Daar heeft hij heel veel jaren gemalen en daar heb ik het, het vak eigenlijk weer van, van overgenomen. En zodoende ben ik ook in de molens terechtgekomen. Zonder molens geen Nederland, 
in het westen van Nederland is het groot deel van het land onder zeeniveau. We staan hier in de Schermenpolder, ik sta hier op zeeniveau. Als we hier achter me kijken, dan zien we de bodem van het voormalige Schermenmeer 3,5 meter onder zeeniveau. In 1633 met 52 van deze molens droogmalen. We malen het water van de binnenboezem min 3 naar de bovenkolk min 1,70 meter. Een deel van de molens in Nederland staat eigenlijk nog als noodbemaling te boek. Dus hier in de schermer kunnen we van de elf die we nog hebben, kunnen we er zes inzetten voor noodbemaling. Door die klimaatsverandering zien we echt dat die waterhoeveelheid in de tweede helft van de zomer zo explosief gaat toenemen dat die buien zo zwaar worden, dat op een kort moment zoveel water valt dat het bestaande capaciteit het niet aan kan. En dat proberen we met die molens. Nog achter, te achtervangen, zou ik maar zeggen. Nou, wat is nou. het weer? Hoe lik het, hè? We moeten de kap nog wat kruien, volgens mij. Ja. Op dit moment zit ik op een derde van de opleiding. Uh, ik ben hier ongeveer 17 keer geweest. Iedere zaterdag uh, zijn we aan het malen. En uh, we gaan dan soms even naar de kap toe om wat onderdelen te bespreken. En uh, op dinsdagavond uh, hebben we af en toe een theorieavond waarbij we alle onderdelen weer doornemen en uh, het ook over andere molens hebben. Want dat hoort ook bij de opleiding. Uh, maar voornamelijk uh, is het belangrijk dat ik deze molen ken voor het examen. Werk op de molen is uh, fysiek heel zwaar. Daarom uh, ga ik regelmatig uh, eigenlijk vier keer per week naar de sportschool om sterker te worden. En zodat ik straks alle handelingen zelf kan uitvoeren. Wat doen we? Vol zeil of half zeil? Of wat, hoe denk je erover? Ik denk dat we wel vier volle zeilen nodig hebben. Ja, nou, dat zijn we wel eens uh, dik, hè? Ja? Ja. We hebben in Nederland zo'n uh, 1200 molens momenteel. En er zijn maar een paar beroepsmolenaars. Dus het is wel belangrijk dat die andere molens ook nog draaien. Er zijn rond 1500 vrijwilligers. En daarvan is de gemiddelde leeftijd vrij hoog. Dus het is heel belangrijk dat we jeugd bij krijgen. En dat de jeugd meedoet en enthousiast wordt om eh, gediplomeerd op zijn molen te draaien. De wind loopt iets om, dus dan eh, moeten we toch een stukje kruien. Ja. Ik heb dus twee zonen die allebei dus het molenaarsvak ook gaan overnemen. Eén is er al van bezig. En daarnaast natuurlijk mijn taak binnen het ambachtelijk koren molenaarsschilde. Om dus wat het molenaarsambacht en vak inhoudt. Om dat op schrift te stellen en om dat ook vast te leggen. En ook door te geven aan de nieuwe generatie die in de leer is op dit moment. Huh? Goedemiddag, Goedemiddag allemaal. Ik vind het heel leuk om molenaar te zijn op deze molen, omdat je echt met de wind bezig bent. Je bent met het graan bezig, je bent met molenstenen bezig en je bent ook nog met een monument bezig, zoals we dat noemen. Wat is het verschil tussen een windmolen en een watermolen? Het verschil tussen een windmolen en een watermolen is dat deze molen wordt door de wind aangedreven. Als je buiten staat, dan voel je de wind en de wieken die draaien. En een watermolen die wordt aangedreven door water. Zo, hè? Mooi. Ja. Het grootste verschil zit hem voornamelijk in dat ik eigenlijk al heel de week bezig ben met het watermanagement hier van de, van de molen. Op het moment dat het ja, hevige regenbuien krijgt, moet je daar echt op inspelen en moet je meteen reageren. Hier ben je echt elke dag met het water bezig voor je watermolen en natuurlijk voor de omliggende natuur. Ja. Wat zijn nou de grootste risico's op een watermolen? Het grootste risico is dat er uh, vuil of een boomstam of iets uh, onder je waterrad schiet. En daardoor je waterrad gewoon echt muurvast komt te zitten. En dan, ja, dan kun je de brand weer bellen om uh, terug uit te laten uh, draaien. Want dan krijg je anders uh, ja, niet zelf voor elkaar. Hè. Uh, 
als we molens willen behouden, zou je ervoor moeten zorgen dat je sowieso ook goede molenmakers hebt. Dat het ambacht in van molenmakerij, molenmaken, molenherstel, molenonderhoud, dat dat blijft. Maar ook goede molenaars moet hebben. Want wil je ze inzetten in tijden van nood, als het noodzakelijk is, moet je wel volk hebben die ermee om kan gaan. Over een half jaar hoop ik examen te doen. Uh, Zo'n examen wordt uh, op de eigen molen, dus deze molen, afgenomen. En dat duurt ongeveer zo'n anderhalf uur. En daar uh, is uh, mijn leermeester bij en nog uh, gecommitteerden die het examen afnemen. En uh, daarbij uh, moet ik allerlei verschillende handelingen uh, verrichten. Maar krijg ik ook theoretische vragen uh, over uh, bepaalde situaties die zich voor kunnen doen. Ik heb hem wel eens geknepen in die zin dat uh, met een omwisbui, uh, met warm weer, dat je bijvoorbeeld met vier volle zeilen staat en dat er een, een grote omwisbui in de zomermaanden op komt zetten. En dat je dan denkt van nou moet ik toch wegwezen. Dus dan moet je heel snel de molen stilzetten, uitspannen en zorgen dat je weg bent. En dan uh, is elke minuut te veel eigenlijk. Kijk, als het fout gaat en je bent te laat, is het natuurlijk mogelijk dat de molen op hol slaat, dat er dingen gebeuren bij, waar je dus vaartig geen, niet meer de hand aan hebt. Dus als een wiekenkruis door nalatigheid uit de molen gemalen wordt, ja, een paar ton schade heb je zo te pakken. Dus je moet leren vooruitzien. Onze molen produceert ongeveer 200 ton op jaarbasis, dus dat is 200.000 kilo. En dat is dus voldoende om een sluitende exploitatie van het molenbedrijf te krijgen. We zijn in Nederland ongeveer met 40 beroepsmolenaars die dus dagelijks produceren. Waarvan er een tiental bedrijven, een kleine tien, dus helemaal bestaan van het molengebeuren. En daarnaast zijn er dus een aantal molenbedrijven die dus een pannenkoekenhuis of een restaurant daarnaast exploiteren. En dus wel hun eigen producten in het restaurant gebruiken. Mijn ouders die hebben helemaal niks met molens, maar ik ben uh, ja, gewoon uh, ontzettend gefascineerd hoe dit ooit allemaal is gebouwd in 1850 en hoe het allemaal werkt. Dit is de eindpresentatie uh, van mijn studie. Op deze avond heb ik uh, mijn businessplan getest. Het is natuurlijk prachtig mooi zo'n molen, alles draait en werkt. Maar uh, ik wil eigenlijk nog veel meer. Vroeger was dit een plek waar mensen elkaar ontmoetten en waar ze hun nieuwtjes uitwisselden. En dat wil ik eigenlijk weer uh, terugbrengen. Dat hier uh, ja, veel meer mensen over de vloer komen. En dat ze naast de werking van de molen uh, ook mijn producten kunnen gaan proeven. Ik word dus molenaar en gastvrouw. Well, that's the film we had made because of the application at UNESCO. But that's very interesting. And now it's time for our third speaker, or speakers, I must say, Antoine Gauthier and Marjana Amin about the craft of the miller in Canada. And I ask them to join us. Hello, Antoine. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hello. And hello, Marjana. Welcome to this conference. And I will give you the floor for your presentation. Thank you very much. First of all, good morning, because here in Canada, it's the morning. A little coffee, thank you. All right, so I am Antoine Gauthier. I'm gonna share my screen here so everybody can see the PowerPoint. All right. Okay, so I'm Antoine Gauthier, CEO of the Quebec Council for Intangible Heritage. Very happy to be here with you. I'm, I am joined by Marjan Amin, who's a consult consultant for uh, the Canadian Heritage of Quebec, who owns a mill in Les Um, And she's going to be happy to say a, a little word about this, this mill at the end and answer to, uh, to the questions. 
So just a little word about this, the Quebec Council of Intangible Heritage. Uh, it's the umbrella organization for more than 100 organization in the French part of Canada, in Quebec. And um, we have a lot of a lot of programs, including some some milling activities, but mainly it's for all ICH. Um, and here are the um, a little map of the members we have. So we do a lot of activities, including some uh, milling studies. That, that's why we've been uh, asked today to uh, to present the last study we we made together with uh, some consultant, together with Marjan, and together with the milling association uh, in Quebec, and of course uh, the the millers. So we we proceeded to some survey, some consultation uh, regarding the old mill si still in operation in the Saint Lawrence Valley. Uh, in order to assess what are exactly the, the, the training needs for the actual millers, what do they need to uh, improve themselves, uh, because mostly the study was financed by the Ministry of Employment, so in, in, in order to give some uh, training for the professionals, but also to, uh, to see what could be done for the initial training for the, the people to be apprentice and how we how could we foster some uh, new people to become millers? So with some safeguarding re recommendation, this study is entirely available on our website on PDF. It's in French, um, and uh, it provides a lot of information. I'm just gonna talk very very briefly today about some information included in that report that we just launched this year. Um, so in, in Quebec, there's, there's around like seven or eight uh, still uh, working mill. Um, there's maybe a, a, a hundred still standing, but not in function. But uh, basically those are the, uh, the, the, the mill still in activity. I know a, a bunch of uh, millers and and uh, responsible for mills are listening from Canada. I'm, I'm, I say hello to, to everybody. Um, and thanks for your participation. And overall, thanks for your, your great work, of course, in, uh, in uh, grinding flour. So th those are some of the most important mill in, uh, in Quebec, one in Les Eboulements, uh, who's working at Marjan. One is uh, Lille Coudre. One is uh, saint roch des aunay and the other one, Saint-Eustache. So the, those are, have, have Miller still, uh, professional Miller. Some are uh, owned by a pri uh, private corporation or non-for-profit organization or uh, by uh, the city. So we have a lot of kind of a figure, like what type of energy is used in the mill, as you can see, there's only one still remaining functioning uh, windmill. The rest is with water and some, some supply with electric uh, power. And then what are the characteristic uh, without conservative agent, uh, without uh, OGM uh, genetically modified for four of them? You know, so you've got a, a lot of figures like that. How, how many uh, flower, uh, is produced in the mill. So the, I, I'm not going to talk about all the details. It's all in the report. You can consult, but it's the kind of things you have in the, the report. What are the principal, the, the, the main competitors, uh, the miller says? Uh, what age are the millers right now? We're talking about around 10 people. Right? It's, not, it's not a lot of people. Uh, how did they learn? So it, apprenticeship mainly and uh, uh, self-trained and how the, the miller would say it's better to learn it's all like a master to apprentice that's the main the main way to learn uh, according to the millers uh, what kind of uh, what kind of uh, technical uh, training they would like to have more so in order to organize some some new trainings but, but mostly what are the, the, the main issues 
to develop the, 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 the craft of the miller sector. Uh, the main one is to prepare uh, new people to become millers, so uh, apprentices. This is the main concern right now in Quebec for the millers and for the, for the organizations that run mills is to uh, prepare some new people to become miller and it's, it's not always easy in, uh, in those times. So just before to give the, the final uh, notes to, Mar the, the, to Marjan, uh, as we saw with other countries, it's of course some limited flower niche production. It's not um, very industrial production of flour that could supply a lot of supermarkets. We're talking more about a niche production. Of course, there's a lot of tourism uh, involved and a link between the built heritage because it, it's needed a lot of resources to keep those mills, to old, old buildings uh, still functioning, especially with water, uh, water issues, of course. Um, and uh, of course, the mills are a good example of sustainable developments. That, that's a, a good way to teach people and children how to make some energy and, and use it at a local level. Um, and the, the main purpose of our study with uh, collaboration of, uh, of the stakeholders in the, in the milling uh, sex, uh, craft making is ob obviously to foster apprenticeship. So we're going to use this report to make new partners and to try to, uh, to organize new way of teaching or new organization involved or, uh, or new money to help the mills trying to find new millers. So that's one of the key points we're going to work on on the, those days. Um, and yeah, thanks, thanks to the Ministry of Employment for helping us and the Ministry of Culture, of course, and uh, the Association of, mill, of uh, Mills in Quebec. I'm just going to pass the, the balloon to Marjan to say a few words. Marjan. Yes, so hello and thank you to uh, Antoine to invite, invite me uh, to join this discussion and thank you to all the organizations, organizers also. So I just would like to, to add a few words about um, the Eboulement Mill. So it's situated in a rural um, uh, place in, in Quebec. And this mill was built in 17, uh, 1790 and uh, have been owned by the uh, Canadian Heritage of Quebec in 1952 and um, entirely restored in the 80s uh, by the actual millers. So his name is Jean-Guy Tremblay and this miller uh, learned his work by working just uh, so without uh, any uh, official training. Uh, since, as uh, Antoine uh, uh, said, it, there is actually no training uh, for the miller in Quebec. Um, there is also a few millers uh, still working in, in, in mill, even if there is a, a lot of mill, uh, a lot of mills that could be maybe uh, restored and, and turned on again. And so, um, with the Canadian Heritage of Quebec, I began a study um, to, to collect the, the skills and the honor of this miller, so Jean-Guy Tremblay, and, uh, and, to, and to preserve uh, this practice um, almost theori theoretically. And um, I began this in uh, 2014 and um, after a few years, well, we um, we succeed in make this uh, this practice of Jean Guy Tremblay recognized as as a cultural intangible cultural uh, heritage of Quebec, um, and uh, we also work with the Millers Association of Quebec um, 
to make recovery all the practice, all the Miller practice as a as a intangible cultural heritage. And just now in uh, in uh, 2020, we we start a training program that I, I build up uh, with the with the Canadian Heritage of Quebec, and with the collaboration also with of the of uh, well um, employee. Emploi Québec is like a, I don't know how to say, a, a employee a institution of Quebec um, that finance uh, partly this program and is is like a project pilot uh, or pilot pilot project for now, and we are trying to 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 find uh, ways to 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 make a training for for this miller and uh, and now we are collaborating also with the with the um uh conseil québécois de, du patrimoine vivant and uh, so with uh, antoine gautier to 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 make this uh, training uh uh starting in all the the quebec quebec province so that's why what uh, i will have to share with you Thank you. Yeah, great, great. Thank you for this uh, presentation, you both. And there was a question in the Q&A, uh, how many professional millers are there in uh, Canada? Do you know? Um, in Canada, there are very few. Uh, well, Antoine said that, said that there is a uh, seven or eight mill uh, uh, active, but we, well, so there is less than 10 millers in in canada okay. and they they all have uh, more than uh, than uh, 45 years so there's a real problem also for the for the yes the yeah. really we hear um i ask eric is there well, because we're a little bit la running late but is there one small question from the q a well, there, there is a small question, but maybe a, 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 a difficult answer. But if you can be short, how is the situation in other parts of Canada concerning mills and millers? Well, uh, personally, I don't know because I almost studied the, the situation in Quebec. So I, I really don't have uh, information about that, but I don't think it's really better. <laughs> Okay, for Thank myself, I don't have information about it. I, I don't think in the western part of Canada, because the, the, the settlements were too, it's too uh, recent to have old mills. I'm not sure there's a much, a lot of uh, mill, old mills still in function in the English part of Canada, but uh, we're not uh, really aware of it so far. Maybe it's a good task for us in order to yeah. Yes, we'll, we'll put to, it to, to the answer list. this question. Work in we'll, progress. We we'll put it to the list. Yes. Well, thank you, Antoine and Marjan. Thank you very much for your presentation and your answers to the questions. And there are some more questions, but Eric will try to answer them or send them through to Antoine or Marjan later on. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, then we go to the last speaker. If uh, Marjan and Antoine will stop their video. And that is Philip Tomaszewski, who is going to speak with us about windmills in Poland and Polish traditional milling. Philip, very welcome to the conference. Um, well, I want to ask you to start your presentation, please. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity to participate in this conference and it's a great honor for me. Uh, my name is uh, Filip Tomaszewski uh, and I am an uh, architect uh, and in my professional work I deal with with the renovation and of uh, historic windmills and uh, I also work as an assistant professor at the Institute of Architecture. Uh, sorry, I Put your PowerPoint on, yes. Okay, I, I have to try to share uh, my PowerPoint. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm afraid, okay, I, I will try to 
Okay, can you see? Yes, this is oh, no. okay. Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, it's it's great. Uh, okay, uh, can you see uh, two old windmills now? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Go on. Okay, fine. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, as I said, I, I also work as an uh, assistant uh, professor at the Institute of Architecture and Urban Planning in uh, which University of Technology in, in, in Poland. Um, uh, I would like to, um, to show you that what the situation of windmills in Poland uh, looks like. Uh, I don't have uh, detailed data on uh, water mills, uh, so in my uh, presentation uh, I will focus uh, on uh, on windmill, and uh, uh, I I would like to say something about facts and figures on, on windmills in Poland. And uh, today we have uh, 65 windmills in open air museums, and uh, there are. Uh, 43 post mills, uh, when, uh, 12 uh, Dutch mills and 10 uh, Paltrock mills. Uh, but uh, in the register of historical monuments, uh, we have uh, 254 windmills, and uh, most of them are in uh, Greater uh, Poland, it's, it's 88. Uh, and uh, we have uh, around 60 windmills, uh, which, which are uh, situated in their natural landscape uh, in situ, uh, which, which were restored in the last 20 years and which are in a good uh, technical uh, condition. Uh, unfortunately, we have zero uh, everyday working windmills, and the last working windmill was uh, was the uh, windmill in in Hlepczyn, in Mazovia region, and uh, it worked uh, until uh, 1985. Uh, and now we have around 10 uh, windmills uh, which work occasionally, so they are they are in in good uh, condition and uh, and in a workable uh, state uh, and uh, most of them are in the uh, open air uh, museums and uh, formerly uh, the number of windmills in Poland before the World War II uh, it was uh, something about of course six uh, six thousand uh, uh, 360 uh, windmills uh, and uh, after uh, the war uh, the number of windmills uh, was uh, only uh, 867. Of course uh, we have to remember that the borders of, of Poland has uh, changed <laughs> after after war. Uh, of course this uh, numbers we have uh, treat as uh, some, some estimation. Okay. Uh, uh, of course, we have uh, the modern <laughs> mills uh, in Poland, and uh, uh, we have around uh, 500 working mills uh, and uh, around uh, 100 uh, uh, big mills with an e efficiency uh, 200 or, or 300 tons a day, the, and they provide 90% uh, of the flour on the market. Uh, but we have also the small mills uh, up to uh, uh, 30 tons a day, and uh, they cannot. Uh, compete with the large ones uh, when it comes to basic flower flowers uh, ther therefore they make special flower including wholemeal flower and they uh, can find uh, some market niche and they can uh, function uh, thanks to it mm. Uh, this is the oldest windmill in Poland uh, and it is located in the Museum of the First Piasts in Lednica uh, in the so-called uh, Small Open Air Museum and this is a post mill uh, from the Grzyna village 
and it was built in uh, 50, uh, 1585. Uh, if it comes on mill organizations in Poland, uh, we have the Polish Association of Employers uh, of the Grain and Milling Industry, and this is former Association of Millers of the Republic of Poland. And uh, this organiza organization uh, associates uh, milling companies, not persons, uh, engaged in the in contemporary, uh, contemporary modern uh, milling. And also we have uh, uh, Polish uh, uh, Molinological Association uh, and uh, this organi organization associ associates enthusiasts of old mills and uh, traditional uh, milling. And this association has just been founded and it is in the organization phase. So it's very, very young uh, organization. Uh, government involvement in uh, traditional milling. Uh, today we have no programs aimed only at supporting traditional milling. Uh, uh, we have uh, subsidies related to the monument uh, generally, so we have some monument protection system and you can get uh, the money, for example, for some uh, maintenance uh, of, of uh, monuments, also, of course, the uh, windmills and, and water mills. Uh, and uh, of course, we have uh, we have uh, something about thirty uh, museum uh, in open air museum, and they are uh, financed by uh, private ship uh, self governments. Uh, so uh, uh, the open air museums are very uh, very important. Uh, uh, very important organi organizations who, which uh, protect uh, the um, mills. Uh, Miller's problems. Uh, of course, we uh, we try to first we try to save uh, the mills. It's uh, today it's the it's uh, uh, most. Uh, the, important uh, problem in Poland uh, that we we have uh, uh, a lot of uh, mills which are in a very very bad condition uh, but uh, of course uh, very important problem uh, connected with uh, intangible uh, heritage uh, we, now we there is no schools uh, to educate professional millers uh, Future millers are trained just in mills. Uh, of course, it, this problem concerns modern milling, but also the traditional milling. Uh, in, in traditional mills, there are occasional trainings, uh, sessions for amateurs, students, and children. Uh, and uh, what's important, the most mills, uh, with mills, of course, uh, organize workshops connected with uh, traditional uh, milling. Uh, and there are many organizational problems with keeping windmills in operation. Uh, and it, co it concerns most of uh, open air uh, museums. Uh, now uh, I would like to uh, show, show you some. <laughs> uh, some uh, examples of, of windmills in Poland. First, some sad <laughs> examples. Unfortunately, uh, many windmills are in, uh, in this uh, condition uh, today. Uh, so as you see, the situation <laughs> is, is very uh, dramatic. Uh, but of course, uh, fortunately, <laughs> Uh, there are many positive examples. Uh, uh, here, uh, I would like to present my favorite windmill uh, in Leszno. It's in a greater Poland, uh, and it was moved and renovated in uh, uh, 2018, uh, two years ago. 
Uh, the windmill has uh, very uh, well uh, preserved equipment and the technology has been converted into, into an electric drive. Uh, fortunately, all, uh, all the elements uh, characteristic of windmills uh, remained. Uh, I'm asking uh, you to speed up a little bit so we have some... Okay, I, I, will, uh, I, will, uh, uh, I will try to, to finish my, uh, my presentation. Uh, this windmill uh, was built in uh, 1728. And I will show you uh, a few pictures connected with, uh, uh, with maintenance uh, of this uh, monument. Uh, of course, uh, everything was restored, uh, not only uh, the building, but also uh, the whole uh, equipment. Uh, and here we, we, you can see the interior of this, of this windmill. Mm, and now uh, he is fully uh, restored, and uh, and it's uh, it can it can work uh, today. But the problem is that there is no uh, miller uh, inside. So again, uh, uh, I, I can say that that um, uh, that we have problem with uh, with uh, keeping. Uh, mills uh, operating. operating. Uh, that's all very much uh, for, for your attention. Thank you, thank you very much, Philippe, and thank you for sharing that with us. I hear from Eric, there is one question, Eric. Yes, a very short and uh, uh, very easy question for you, Philip. Mm -hmm. uh, you spoke about 90% uh, uh, of your mills uh, produces flour, so uh, uh, a lot of corn mills. Uh, what about the 10 other percent uh, of, of uh, mills? Are those uh, industrial mills? Uh, no, they are not industrial mills. They are small mills uh, which uh, produce uh, also uh, for 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 the market, uh, so only the special kinds of uh, flour, but but also for for market. But they are they are a small mills. In uh, I mean they uh, they can produce up to uh, thirty tons uh, a day. Okay. Well, thank you, Philippe. Um, I think uh, it's time to start the panel session. I want to ask every uh, speaker to put on the uh, video and put on your microphone. And then we will start with our panel discussions and hope we uh, inter involve you as uh, participants. Okay. Thank you. Um, there will be four questions in this uh, panel session which will be presented one by one. And uh, you as participants can fill in the questions. There will be some time, uh, about a minute or so, or shorter if everybody has, uh, has given their answer. And then we will stop the poll and share the results with you. And with these results, I will uh, ask one or two of the speakers to respond. And then we go on to the four questions and have a, a bit of a feeling how you think about uh, the, the theme about the future and networking and connecting. And this is the first poll. The question is to ensure the safeguarding of the Miller's craft exchange in an international network is, a great, is of great importance. Please add your question, uh, your answer. Sorry. And I give you still some time. Where should we answer? No, that is for the participants, not for the speakers, oh. uh, Marianne. So you can still wait until the results come in your screen. And now I'll count down from five, four, three, two, one. And I hope we can now share the results of the poll. And we can see that 82% agrees with this, uh, this uh, question and 
15% partially agree and a few are have, do have no opinion. Maybe I can ask uh, Antoine as our first uh, to respond to uh, the results of this poll. What do you think about it? Or can you give uh, the three most important action or issues you should do to uh, act to uh, try to in a relation to the safeguarding of the middle supply? What would you do? What do you think about this, Antoine? I'm sorry, what's the question again? <laughs> you see that uh, most people are, are agreeing with you to ensure the safeguarding that is the international network is very important. Do you think yeah. so as well? Indeed, because what, what we felt when, when we did the, the study is that the millers are very isolated. They don't really, well, uh, by the nature of their, their work, of course, they're working in a mill and they're working very locally but they don't necessarily know a lot uh, each other, even in the, uh, in the national context. And I think that would be great to foster this sharing information uh, at a national level, at an international level. And uh, it could gi give a lot of information about how we could approach the state, how we could um, manage a way to teach uh, how is organized the school in other places and have the millers t talking to each other. I think it, it would be a very, very useful thing for all the miller community. And Jonathan, uh, how does it, do the, the UK millers feel about this? Is there a need for an international network uh, if they are concerned or are they more concerned with their own mill on a local level? Primarily, I think uh, millers are concerned uh, at a local level. Can you put up your speaker a bit, uh, Jonathan, because you can hear you less. Is that better? Oh, slightly. Okay. So? Yeah, perfect. Great stuff. So I think primarily uh, millers have a, a lot of focus at a local level, challenges in terms of maintenance, in terms of uh, actually just uh, keeping the mill and indeed obviously working the mill for those that are working. But we all recognize that there are, um, you know, there is a clear need uh, for uh, you know, a, a, a core of, of skills and understanding. Uh, and, and this is, I think, something where we can collaborate internationally, where we can look at how each other are delivering training and the structures that uh, we can then look at uh, the delivery of training, but then also recognize the fact that there are local differences in the way that the craft plays out. So our mills are quite different uh, in each part of the world, to say the least. And therefore, I think there is a basis. And I think Antoine's point about, um, in a sense, uh, getting a, a structure set up is where we can really cooperate. Equally, I think we need to cooperate around how we build and finance this. Um, so that, I think, is the two areas that I'm seeing a uh, great opportunity for collaboration around. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's nice to go to the next question or statement in the poll. That is, uh, an international network is of added value because, and then there are multiple answers. You can add more than one answer, uh, and which is knowledge exchange of the, on the safeguarding of the craft of the miller, or knowledge exchange on the training and recruitment of millers, knowledge exchange on financing and maintenance of restoration of mills, or cooperation on educational material for tours or schools or those kind of things. And you can give one of those answers or you can even give all four, but for the discussion it's nice if you put the most two important ones maybe. So I'll give you some time to answer. And I understand that some people don't get the poll in the screen because they work on a telephone or a, or pad, but then I will ask the other participants to join in this poll, please. And then I will count down from five to give your last answers. Five, four, three, two, and one. And then I hope you can see the results of this poll. Well, we see that 67% says it's important to exchange knowledge on the safeguarding of the craft, almost the same amount on the training and recruitment. 
a little bit less for the cooperation. Or, and then, oh, let me see. I see a little bit less in the cooperation of educational materials and tours. Okay, I think I had another one or not. Those are the three. So we see that they're almost equal. Uh, Philippe, what do you think is most needed in the international network to exchange, in your opinion? Is it all three I, or I, one of those most important? I, I agree with, with, with the most of the voters because uh, I think that the uh, two first uh, uh, topics are very, very important because uh, we have to uh, um, the, the knowledge connect uh, related to, to, to the traditional milling, to the craft of the, of the miller uh, is, is very special and, and and equal for, for all countries, I think. The, the, the same problem uh, we, we can see in, in Poland and we can see, for example, in Canada. So, uh, so I think that uh, it is very important to, to exchange the, uh, this knowledge. And, uh, and I think that uh, uh, there is, there is also a problem with with the not only with the millers but also with uh, the people who restore mills. Uh, I I can see it in, in Poland that we make uh, a lot of uh, mistakes and we we try to of course we try to 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 improve uh, uh, the maintenance of the mills, uh, but. Uh, uh, it's because there is no connection between people, uh, and and that's why I think that I agree with with uh, with the most of panelists. Okay, mm -hmm. I have a question in the Q and A, which is uh, perhaps is there is an international federation of mill, and is there aid from the European Union? Uh, Alain, uh, do you know if there's anything about that? Is there? Uh, maybe support in the European Union for a more international federation of mills? What, what would your, your opinion be? I think you must... You asked me whether, whether Europe would be interested in, in, helping, uh, in helping mills? Yes, yes. Uh, well, I think it's therefore it's very, it's very important. I think that we uh, we work together with a number of countries in Europe, and I think I hope that Europe has a lot of money to support yeah. our mills, um, more than we have in Flanders or in Belgium, for instance. Yes. So it would be good, but there's still a challenge here. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's a challenge. It's a challenge, yes. Um, maybe, maybe also a dream. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's good to have dreams and goals. I think we should go to the third question in the poll, and that's about uh, how an international network uh, should be supported. And also here, it's multiple, so you can put more answers uh, for this question. And I already saw in a question in the uh, Q&A about an international mill day, which maybe fits with the last point, joint public activities. So I'll give you some time to fill in this question, this poll. And I hope everybody uh, has joined in now and I will count down for five, four, three, two, one and then I hope we see the results for this poll. Okay, and we can see that we have online discussion platforms, online and real life meetings, which are supported, but most of all, we can see knowledge files and joint public activities. Um, and I can't really see what is the, uh, 87% is that the, I think the online and real life yeah, meetings. Uh, yeah. 
Oh yeah, and details on the participants and the network is the first one. Yeah, so we really want to meet online and real life in different kind of ways. Um, we don't see that much in joint public activities. I see, well, it's still 40%. But uh, Marjana, how do you uh, perceive this, uh, these answers? Well, um, for, of course, it's depend on the, the goal of this international network, but uh, I think at the, at the first time, having the, the contact of all of the skate orders at an international level, it could be great. And also as the public uh, or the participants um, answers, uh, having real live uh, activities or meeting is necessary because we we are talking about the practical uh, knowledge and practical work. So I think mm -hmm. to have a real contact or so and to to be able to visit the different mill, maybe it, it could be a really a great uh, opportunities for all the millers and all the skate orders of the mill. I also see a question coming up in the chat. I must ask you for the questions in the Q&A. That's easier for us. But there's a question if uh, what is the relationship with teams? Because we already have an international network, but that's more on research probably. Uh, Jonathan, do you have an opinion on that? Our relation, how the relationship with this new network should be and the teams network? I think the networks have to work together. You know, many of the people on our call today will be members of TIMS, and it is a fantastic network which is already well established. So I'm always concerned that we avoid, we have a phrase in English, reinventing the wheel. Yeah. Um, so if we can make those connections work, um, I think the, the panelists uh, in the chat mentioned that, you know, TIMS is seen as slightly more of an academic um, sort of based organization often looking at sort of technical aspects of mills, mill history, etc. Um, and that I think is part of what TIMS brings. It brings a much wider and richer uh, array of experience, phenomenal experience and understanding. And it now needs to integrate. I mean, the thing that's striking me here, you know, we are having this as a virtual conference. So if there is a silver lining, a positive that's coming out of this COVID situation, it's that we've now all got our heads around the fact that we can engage from our living rooms, our offices, our mills, um, and talk and discuss. And so, you know, we've talked about, uh, you know, sharing information about how we train and recruit people. It's been great recently to see photographs of young millers in the Netherlands um, celebrated on Facebook. And we're all very envious. How do you get all these young millers so excited about your mills and what you're doing? And we're trying to learn from that. And there's a conversation going online already. Um, so training, recruitment, the whole area of knowledge exchange. For me, it is about making sure we can structure this so that everyone is able to contribute and we're clear about what the objective will be for each of these sessions and people buy into the outcomes and then share together. So I think there's a real opportunity here and uh, let's use our now experience of Zoom and other uh, frameworks yes. like this to, to engage. Absolutely. It is a silver lining, you could say. Um, maybe that's a good moment to start with the last question in my little poll um, about the topic on the next online international conference, because uh, this is our first conference, but um, we are obviously uh, very uh, happy to uh, host a second one. And, uh, but then it's interesting to know what would you like to be the topic, our participants. And we have two uh, possibilities here, and you can choose one of them to make it uh, a bit more difficult. We have an idea on the topic of the next conference, which will also be online. And it can be on a specific topic, or would you like to be more informed about the situation in other countries and to learn more about the network? And of course, a combination is maybe possible, but we try to see what is your preference here. So please fill in the poll and I will count down from five, four, three, two, one. And then Ah, great, 
<laughs> that's also a signal, of course, that uh, either one is uh, very interested uh, and only one person has no opinion, but I think that the person will be very happy to, uh, with either what topic we, we choose. Um, we will give this a really hard thought, how to organize the next one and which topic or which uh, topic to fill in with. Um, thank you. Um, are there from our speakers any last remarks before I close this uh, panel session? If there's anything you say, well, this must be told at this moment, then you can raise your hand now. Otherwise, I will really want to thank our speaker. Oh, Jonathan, of course, yes. I just say one thing which is striking me, that um, the value of international collaboration seems to be that we can put collective pressure on our, our, our own governments to recognize what is going on internationally about safeguarding our milling heritage. And you know, it's put a bit of peer pressure. Um, yeah. And this is a great thing that I think that we can share uh, um, and, and now use to lobby our governments. You know, uh, the UK government, as I said, doesn't put a huge amount into our milling heritage and it's money which is going to help move things forward. And we can learn from the Netherlands uh, equally if we're all able to apply to become part of the UNESCO uh, intangible uh, heritage group. Um, that says something very powerful, which I think is a great step forward. Now that's a great aim for this, uh, this network, of course, to help each other, to strengthen each other, each organization in the situation of the mills and the millers in every country in uh, worldwide. And I really want to thank all speakers uh, for their uh, participation and your input. I know you spend a lot of time uh, preparing everything and we thank you very much for your cooperation. I also want to thank our Minister Ingrid van Ingersolve because uh, she made this possible, this conference. And uh, well, I think this is a great start for the network. And I'm very happy with all the participants uh, who are with us at this moment. Uh, and uh, because that's really the basis of to start working together. Uh, and as Jonathan and all the others all, all already said, uh, this is necessary because we really need to preserve uh, the uh, intangible heritage of the craft of the miller and with it, the mills, of course. Excuse me, uh, I found some uh, question in the Q&A uh, and I wanted to answer. Can I do it now or uh, I have to use some uh, uh, I chart? think there are several questions that we will, we will send them to you so you can answer them in person. And okay. um, that's, I think, better than uh, to do it at the moment. Okay. Uh, Yes, uh, we will make sure that uh, the Q&A questions will be answered by you. Um, okay. We'd all like to say thank you to you, Nicole, and to Eric and your team for everything you've done to bring us all together. I'm sure I speak for everyone else who's outside the Netherlands when I say thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we are very happy to organize the next one. And we already have contacted with the German Mail organization and they are very willing to organize the third conference. So there will be a follow-up from this one and uh, we hope that one day we can see each other live here in the Netherlands or in any other place in uh, the world where there are mills and millers. Um, so we can start to build up this network, to share knowledge, to help each other and to safeguard the craft of the miller. Um, I uh, uh, want to end this which uh, still uh, ask everybody to uh, join in uh, with uh, the network and uh, in the gallery, which is on the website, to put in your profile there. We will change the website a bit so it's easier to join the network and uh, to uh, join the gallery so you can exchange uh, uh, information about each other yourselves. Um, and that's, uh, I think, a great basis uh, to also do it with among, not only in this uh, uh, online setting, but also to contact each other directly. Um, thank you for joining. And I see, uh, thank uh, already uh, many great congratulations everywhere. And we uh, want to end this. And after we close this, uh, uh, this, uh, this session, you will receive a survey on this conference where you can still put in your uh, remarks so we can improve our work even more next time. Thank you very much and uh, thank you. I hope to see you next time.
Thank bye you bye. very much. Bye. Bye.